Welcome back to How China Works. I'm Brendan Davis, your host, and I am Ying Ying Li, your other host. And today we're looking at one of the most crucial topics in all of human relations in general. No pressure, and for navigating business in China or with Chinese people in particular, and that is negotiation. Negotiating styles and strategies in China refer a lot to ancient philosophies and leaders of the past, such as the study of Tai Ji or the classic book The Art of War by Sun Tzu. We'll talk about what this means, not just in theory, but also in practice, giving you lots of detailed information that will really help illustrate these various principles and techniques, so that you'll recognize them when you see them in action and be better able to deal with them. Some of the relevant cultural knowledge involved here are topics that we talk about in detail on previous shows, or will be featured on upcoming ones. So, if you want to learn more about something, just give a quick search on the website or your podcast app to see if we cover it already or have it on our schedule. We'll also discuss how to successfully negotiate a contract in China that works for all parties concerned. One quick tip is to place a big emphasis on creating a win-win and maintain flexibility in the process. But now I'm getting ahead of myself. This is a good one. Let's get to it. Okay, Ying Ying, we could really start this show in a lot of places, but why don't we start with how Tai Chi culture affects negotiation in China? Well, I could start my answer to that question in a lot of ways too, but I've thought a lot about this, and there are three fundamental principles of Tai Chi that are really relevant to Chinese negotiating: harmony, face, and guanxi. We've talked a little about the importance of establishing guanxi or good relationships on previous shows, and we will do a special episode all about that in a few weeks. Also, the need to maintain harmony never goes away in Chinese society either, and guanxi and harmony together are also related to giving respect or protecting someone's face, which is the topic of next Monday's show. But how do these concepts manifest in the context of negotiating? Ying Ying. I think maybe the most helpful thing to look at relevant to Tai Chi in this case is aggression. Tai Chi teaches you to not be aggressive. Now you should not just surrender either. And in fact, Tai Chi emphasizes the need to fight back when someone attacks, but it stresses that you should do so using not only strength but wisdom. It is felt that this approach will win a battle more decisively and honorably than using mere strength alone. Tai Chi is a component of Taoism and is often associated with Confucius. But a second approach is related to the classic military strategy book, The Art of War. The Art of War was written by the famous Chinese general Sun Tzu. I'll have a lot more to say about this as we go, but can you give us an introduction, please? Sure thing, Brandon. There is a saying in Chinese: 商场如战场。商场如战场。It means that the market is like a battlefield. Someone who has studied Sun Tzu is likely to view every negotiation as a strategic competition for an ultimate victory. You know that seems at odds with the more win-win approach implied by the Tai Chi model. Hey, I never said they were totally compatible. Just that they are both common. Why don't we look at a few of Sun Tzu's lessons that are well known everywhere? Fair enough. Well, one of the most famous ones sounds a little more Tai Chi style. A leader leads by example, not by force.、Uh, Sun Tzu also has several variations on "Know thyself, know thy enemy," which is always helpful, of course. But as you do a deeper read of Sun Tzu, he starts to sound a whole lot more gangsta. You can kind of see where his ideas combine with Machiavelli's to heavily influence Robert、mm-hmm. Greene, who wrote this、uh, kind of modern handbook on negotiating strategy called "The Forty Eight Laws of Power."、Um, that book is really popular in prisons and gang culture, by the way. Wow, interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Well, Sun Tzu also offers such thoughtful advice as, when strong, avoid them; if of high morale, depress them; seem humble to fill them with conceit; if at ease, exhaust them; if united, separate them; attack their weaknesses; emerge to their surprise. Gee, it's too bad that we can't see examples of those strategies playing out on the world stage right now anywhere, such as, say, in the trade battle, right? <laughs> Once again, you said it, not me. So that you don't have to. Very funny. Lastly, for now, Sun Tzu is, of course, also the man responsible for maybe the most timeless strategic advice of all, which is keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. Now, let's give an example of how a typical Chinese negotiation might play out in reality. Okay, going back to Tai Chi, let's say, for example, that there is a meeting with two parties, A and B. A is pitching B on a deal with different opinions. If A, who is very passionate, not convinced by B, he will find a lot of information to prove that he is right. Then, as someone who believes in starting late but arriving first, 
Bea's first move is to listen to A quietly without arguing back, waiting for A to finish, and then calmly puts a smile and tells A, your advice is better than mine. When our budget is enough, you can definitely try it. The practice of B is listening to A quietly, asking questions about the part that he doesn't understand, and letting the other party answer. After several rounds of questions and answers, B can fully understand A's position and original intention. Whether the opinions are feasible or not, B will now have a more comprehensive understanding. B might then end the conversation by saying something like, Thank you for your nice points. I don't even realize that until now. B has proven themselves a master of this style in the following ways. They have stayed silent and gathered all the free information they could from A. They have a more complete understanding of A's position and then can formulate the best response to it. The reply doesn't commit them to action, but it gives A some face for sharing the nice points, which makes everyone feel good and keeps the door open for future conversations. There's not even a deal in place yet, but the negotiation is already a win-win. Nice! And that brings us to the end goal of most Western negotiations, agreeing to and executing a contract. But all the negotiating in the world doesn't mean a thing if you don't understand how contracts are viewed and honored in a given context. And in the context of business in China, anyone from the outside who has experience with contracts here will tell you that these two processes are viewed vastly differently. Yes. Of all the places where misunderstandings can arise, this is one of the most common Yeah, the word dishonesty gets thrown around a lot as to how things are negotiated here, and in a strictly technical sense from the Western perspective, this can sometimes feel kind of accurate. But this reputation for dishonesty in business negotiations mostly comes from a fundamental disconnect as to what a contract is, what it means, and how final it is here, not because the other party is being dishonest. Brandon, you have done a lot of cross-border business and have been in this situation many times. What would you say is the main difference? Well, the main takeaway that I want everyone to get from this, regardless of which side of the table you're on, is this. Here's how you make a contract in the West, right? You negotiate every fine detail up front. Uh, If you come to terms, then you drop a contract. Then you sign it, which is called executing it for a good reason. Because then if the contract is deviated from it any meaningful way, the deal is killed. Now, what's more, contracts in the West are binding in an absolute sense. If the other party is in breach, then they are legally liable. And that means something that's mutually understood to be non-negotiable at that point, and it's bad. Now, maybe a settlement of some kind can be negotiated to cure the breach after the fact, but there's no honor left at that point, and you're in a very hard position to try and move forward. Very true. But in China, a contract isn't viewed in the same way. In the Chinese style, a negotiation starts from the general principles of a deal and then moves into the details farther down the road. Once those principles have been put to the test in practice, the two parties have to begin the cooperation and then adjust based on the realities they discover. It is considered important to be strong, but not to push too strong in general. And you see this play out in both strategy and tactics, such as the Sun Tzu we quoted earlier indicates. But as far as creating a contract is concerned, for the Chinese, a focus on putting too many details into such a legal document would be regarded as a lack of trust which therefore undermines the relationship-building part of things, which is crucial important to their side of the table. You know, when I first started dealing with business here, the conclusion I came to at the time was that negotiations never seem to end in China. Mm -hmm. Now, what I've learned with some experience and hopefully a little maturity is that I was right but that that's actually a part of the style here. The Chinese consider this to be a feature, not a bug. Now, why is that, Inging? I mean, it's one thing to offer generalities and personal examples to prove them correct, but what are some things we can share with the people here to help them navigate this for themselves? Well, one thing is to always know in any contest that Chinese people take a very holistic view of situations. They are long-term thinkers who value face and maintaining harmony in personal relationships above all. So in a negotiation, the Chinese want to first build a personal relationship with you and create an adequate level of trust between the parties before they move forward in a meaningful way. It's really important to understand and always remember that the Chinese do not do business with your company, but with you. As in you, 
personally, the person they know, not you or your representative in your absence. You and your presence in meetings is critical. In the entertainment business, there is often a key man clause in higher level contracts between companies. These specify that if a certain player leaves Company A, then Company B can renegotiate the deal or kill it with a defined plan of how things proceed from there. Now, this is a little similar to the Chinese style, where although it isn't spelled out in the contract this same way, it is absolutely understood that it is the people making the deal, not the companies. And if the people change, the deal is very likely going to change too. Exactly, because of a lot of reasons: historical embarrassments, regional differences, geographical size, and the huge population. China has evolved to be a low trust society. They need to know you to trust you. That's why Chinese like to take the foreign counterparts for dinner because they want to know them better. And the more international style of quickly hammering out a freestanding one-time agreement with someone is needed, and then honoring it out of any other context is very unlike the Chinese process of wanting to create a long-term relationship first, one that touches on many areas and opportunities for cooperation, and not just the one deal on the table at the moment. Which is why almost every movie deal I've ever been involved with here has also included a real estate development, a theme park, or a ride, a racetrack, a space shuttle. Just kidding, or some other seemingly very random add-on too. If people here know you, like you, and trust you, they want to do as much as they can with you. Because just like everywhere else, good friends are hard to come by. Like you, Yingying. Wow, that's really sweet, Brandon. And I can tell you really know China. Why? Thank you. And honestly, that telling a foreigner that they understand China even a little bit is one of the highest compliments a Chinese person can pay you. Mostly because it means that they felt it themselves, and they know it's hard. So I appreciate it. Well, I mean it. So it's not just a small talk, but one other thing to know is that small talk is also an essential part of the game here. So don't take offense at it. Please, of course, you don't want to talk about taboo topics, but you can and should talk about things like people's kids, family, what do you like about their food or city, small things about our culture or history, anything that shows you really care about knowing us, and that also keeps it nice and light and social. It's good manners and also a great way to build some guanxi, which will make any eventual negotiations you get into that much more successful. Thanks, Yingying. Well, this was a long one, so we'll keep the wrap up brief today. I'll start by saying that having some extra goodwill in your heart and mind when approaching Chinese partners will help them gain face, which is great for both of you. And meeting someone halfway whenever possible is a very useful way to save the heavy lifting for when and where it matters the most. Never forget that patience is the most important asset when it comes to negotiating with Chinese, and to focus on the bigger picture at the beginning instead of all the details. Tomorrow we'll look at how to express gratitude and when it's appropriate to use the Chinese equivalent versions of yes, no, please, and thank you. And we'll wrap up our week of decoding Chinese communications by looking at how humor and jokes are used in China, which will be a lot of fun. I'm Ying Ying Li, and I'm Brendan Davis. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share our show. And thanks for joining us on How China Works.